right, grandeur policy. So that was a disconnect. Um, then particularly after the Crimea annexation, um, she definitely is now willing to provide harder sanctions. Um, uh, the problem with yeah, these sanctions, getting them through just alone in Germany, is very difficult. You can't act too decisively for a number, for three reasons. First reason is domestic, the domestic institutions. Merkel, you may hear a lot about her, but she doesn't govern alone right now. She governs in a grand coalition with, she's a center-right Christian Democrat, right? Um, she governs in a coalition with the left, more leftist social democrats. Indeed, our foreign minister is a social democrat. And social democrats have, uh, in the past, continuously favored what you may have heard the term East politic or Ost politic, right? They branded this during the Cold War. So social democrats take a much more lenient approach towards Russia, still today. Um, and there were many, so there is a problem with her grand coalition. There are conservatives in her own party who would not support a hardline approach because they're worried about the fallout. Um, and there's also the third largest party in Germany is, for example, the left party, the former East German Unity Party, which is absolutely against NATO, any NATO activity, and by now they're the third largest party. So that's a little bit about domestic institution. Secondly, um, Germany, as you may know, is um, trying, is sort of the leading economy in the euro zone, in the euro crisis. And as such, um, the recovery of the eurozone, and I'm sure you heard all about the euro crisis, hinges on German continued economic growth, um, for better or for worse. Uh, I'm not going to have time to go into that. But the fact is, if she cannot endanger with economic sanctions that would hurt the German companies that have set up anything from energy companies to mineral and companies to car com automobile companies. She cannot endanger German growth because the German growth will be dragged down, eventually the whole Eurozone and then the European Union will be dragged down, right? So this is another important part that we cannot uh, forget. Even the business lobby in Germany is railing against any more drastic measures. They projected up to 300,000 jobs could be lost in Germany, which you know, Germany should be worried, it has the, one of the lowest unemployment in Europe, but that makes Germans afraid. That brings me to the last point where she kind of react uh, very quickly, because her, she just got re-elected for one of the third, fourth point, um, last fall, and that re-election was based on sort of her being this guarantor of security and stability through the Euro crisis. She cannot endanger that political capital or trust that has been set in her. Um, so the people have elected her for that. They don't want her now to lean out and maybe risk the stability of the German economy. For example, uh, two-thirds of Germans, according to last week's Spiegel survey, um, do not want to see any economic sanctions imposed. Two-thirds of Germans, according to the survey, do not want to see any economic sanctions imposed. And 55% of Germans believe that Ukraine belongs in Russia's sphere of influence. That just goes to show you that it's really not as easy as it may seem. Last one point more is the US relations with Europe, right? So if they have to work together to increase their leverage and more pressure on Russia, what can be done? That is problematic as well. Um, the NSA spying scandal has left um, the former, the, the cooperative climate between um, Obama and Merkel has definitely frozen up somewhat. Um, Obama, the Europeans don't appreciate that President Obama has this pivot to Asia and sort of neglects Europe in that sense. And um, even if he doesn't talk to individual leaders, um, talking to the EU leaders, such as the Commission President Barroso, is just as difficult because it's basically a late session. We have new elections um, this May, so there is no point, even though President Obama is right now in Brussels, to really talk with the EU because they won't do anything decisively until the elections of the European Parliament happen in May. Thank you for your attention.
Yes, pasta is so hot. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vera, and after my presentation, I hope that you will understand why we see the Russian flags in eastern part of Ukraine right now. Um, you will probably understand where the rhetoric of fascist or Nazis that is so widely used in the Russian media and in Ukrainian media, eastern Ukrainian media, where this comes from, and um, also why maybe Europe still perceives um, Ukraine as part of the Russian influence. So what I'm going to do, I will try to take you um, in history, um, so I will use past legacies approach, but um, that was offered by Linz and Stefan in um, their book on democratizations in Eastern Europe. However, um, I'm going to go a little bit beyond the 20th century, all the way back to the 17th century, because it's impossible to understand what's going in Ukraine right now, and especially um, how the borders were formed, how ethnicity was built, and what was the role of the great powers in it. You won't be able to understand why we have uh, such a division in this country. So uh, what I will do, I will talk about borders, and we'll look at the map how the territory of Ukraine was being built through the centuries. And then I will talk about ethnic identity construction, and then uh, very briefly I will summarize with um, pointing out to two different um, actually legacies in terms of regime type that uh, especially was the focus of Linz and Stefan in their book because it does make um, a difference uh, for the prospects of democratization whether or not a country was transitioning from an authoritarian regime or a post-totalitarian regime. And we're going to see that that was um, a big difference, that made a difference for uh, Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine. And then uh, the historic periods that are very important will be um, the 1795 through 1917, that's, um, and then I'll explain why, uh, 1917 through 1939, 1939 through 1991. So let's begin. The original uh, territory of Ukraine as we know it, and that's where Ukraine, Ukraine began, is the center of territory that is known maybe in Western sources as um, the Cossack state. More, um, and by the way, my presentation comes more from the Ukrainian sources, um, not the American sources of history, so I don't know if there is any discrepancies, but that's how it's presented in, um, in Ukrainian <laughs> historical sources. And um, the Ukrainian historians write that even this territory was not exactly Ukrainian-Ukrainian. What the leader of this um, territory was doing, he was fighting against Poland to protect um, the Eastern uh, Orthodox um, Christians. And you remember maybe that back in the day, this territory um, was independent, but territories to the west as well as to the north were part of Poland. We call them um, Rich Pospolitaya. And then territories to the, west, uh, to the east were um, part of Russia. Russian Empire, and in 19, um, and after, after um, there was a big insurgency of the Cossacks in Poland suppressed, um, and Russia suppressed them, and that territory became part of Russia. And then Russia and Poland, um, Russia, Austria, Hungary, partitioned Poland, um, there were three partitions in 1791, 1795, and 1799, and according to those partitions, uh, most territory of uh, eastern Ukraine uh, went to Russia. And we Lublin, oh I have a paper, I'm sorry. Lublin, we um, and territory south of it went to um, Austria-Hungary. And that's crucial
special here because Austria-Hungary and Russian Empire had very different policies regarding um, ethnic identity building and also autonomy of the people and perceptions that they conveyed. Um, so, what were the policies? Um, the Russian Empire, actually, let me take you through the history. I'm a little bit nervous, it's my first presentation, my first time on the panel, so. Um, <coughs> so what happens is, um, we have Western Ukraine being part of Pol uh, being part of Austria-Hungary, and we have uh, Central and um, Eastern Ukraine becoming part of Russia. But keep in mind that this Eastern Ukraine does not include the South, of Ukraine, the modern Odessa, uh, Kerch, uh, Kherson, Crimea. Back in the day when partition, uh, partitioning of Poland took place, those territories were still um, under the, um, um, the Han, the um, um, Muslim rulers of Ukraine. And Russia gets those territories in the 19th century. And Russia fought very hard on the law for Crimea for over 100 years with um, the Turkish Empire to get this access, strategic access to the Black Sea. So fast forward, 1917, um, the Russian Empire breaks apart. And you can see that on the territory of modern Ukraine, we have several states. We still have uh, part of this um, Adessa, Kira, Donetsk. This is the uh, modern eastern Ukraine. This territory <coughs> was uh, still controlled and became part of the Soviet Union. We had Crimea for a long time, and then um, the south of Ukraine controlled by um, the soldiers that were opposing the imposition of communist rule in um, in, in Soviet Russia. What I need you to understand, and a lot of people might not even know about it, but there was a big struggle, um, the Civil War. Before the Communists and the Soviet Union came into existence, a lot of Russians and other um, ethnic groups fought against communism. So it wasn't like all Russians just adopted communism. There was a blood, um, a lot of bloodshed and then a lot of uh, repressions afterwards. And that's important to remember because not all Russians, not all Ukrainians, and not all Belarusians right now are very unified when it comes to you know, what's going on in Ukraine. So ultimately, Crimea and um, the south of Ukraine becomes part of Soviet Union. Uh, we have, and that's new, this little uh, republic, People's Republic of Ukraine, it was established in 1918, and then Poland and the Soviet Union were fighting over it. But they did have this little territory here. It was an independent republic. So they did have some sort of statehood history. And then Western Ukraine, Poland won, and Western Ukraine becomes part of Poland. And again, it's the same territory, Lvov, Valin, um, Ljubljana. And now we have Western territory of Ukraine being part of Poland up until 1939 when uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact gave those territories back to the Soviet Union. And why is it so important? Because without knowing this history, we won't be able to understand how two different identities came into being and why there are Russian flags in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, I have one more map, it just shows you the enlargement of the territories because partially uh, some territories from Romania were uh, given to Ukraine and then Crimea in 1954, that was a gift, as already Professor Kostadino has said. So, ethnic identity building, two very different approaches. The Russian Empire denied the existence of separate ethnic identity. They never assumed that Ukrainians were um, actually an independent uh, territory that have a right to have self-identification. They were called Malarose, or if you translate it into English, Little Russians. Like Belarusians were called White Russians, and then Ukrainians were Little Russians. So that territory was under intense assimilation throughout the 19th century. Um, that was a little bit um, eased 
at the beginning of the 20th century, 1905. And that assimilation, um, I mean, the push for assimilation was a lot of insurgencies on, on the territories um, of um, Ukraine, uh, Poland, and Belarus that all became part of um, the Russian Empire. But the uh, Tsarist Russia did put a ban on, on Ukrainian language, and they enforced it. They closed all the schools um, in Ukraine. They prohibited the print of books. They even prohibited theaters in, in Ukrainian language. The elite, uh, they also closed the establishments, higher educational establishments, both on the territory of Belarus and Ukraine. So now, if someone wanted to get higher education, and usually it was the elites back then, they had to go to Russia. And um, Russia, um, back in the day, the 19th century, um, they were focusing on um, creating a special Russian identity uh, based on um, Orthodox Christianity, um, and then um, Tsarism, and then um, uh, taking care of the people. Two minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. For, almost done. Thank you. <laughs> and if you see, the Ukrainian church uh, became a member of Eastern Orthodox Church. And I don't know how much you're familiar with Eastern Orthodox Church, but it, it, it does not promote as much independence as, say, the Catholic Church does. It doesn't have that much, um, I guess, organizational independence that might nurture some um, civil society groups.